today is um, Monday, May the 1st, 2023. We'll call the meeting together for the Redevelopment Commission and we'll start the meeting with a roll call. I'm going last. <laughs> uh, Deborah Myers, present. Sarah Bowerly Danson. Randy Casty, present. Deb Hutton, present. Uh, staff, present. Uh, I might point out. Uh, Vice President Hutton that Aaron Cooperman from the NCCSC board is online wow. with us. So ah, okay. So Trustee Cooperman is joining Aaron, us. Aaron, do you want to check in, please? No, we can't hear you. So can you check in verbally? Oh, sure, yes, I'm here. This is Aaron Cooperman. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, John Zodi with Hand Party. Larry on legal. Anyone on Zoom? Yeah. Zodi too from what the hand department is. You others? Okay, let's start with the minutes. Any questions or comments from the uh, commissioners? And these are the minutes of April 17th, 2023. If not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to move approval of the minutes as, as noted. I'll second. Mm -hmm. I'll, um, I have a first and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 And Deb Hutton uh, abstain. Passes unanimously or passes with one abst abstention. Next item, uh, examination of the claims for two, April 28th, 2023 for the amount of $59,839.10. Any questions or comments from the commissioners? And if not, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve the examination of claims from April 28th, 2023. I need a second. Um, I don't think that I received them. I don't remember receiving them, so I'm going to abstain from this because I didn't receive them. Did you receive them? I thought I did. It's possible that I... Uh, can anyone check that they received them? Yeah, let me take a look. Because if we didn't, we shouldn't even make a motion on it. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> you did not. Possibly well, well, you didn't because uh, I think Christina Finley was out of the office on Friday, right. and since the claims to close the 28th, we probably just received them. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so that'll do for both the claims and the payroll registers. Uh -huh. Payroll registers, you probably should have received, though. I'm not seeing nope. that in my files. I didn't get either. No. Okay. Well, yeah, what? Then I, I would suggest just having a motion to postpone this until the next meeting. Approval to the next meeting. Okay, now that motion? Yes, Sarah Bauer Ligensman, I motion to postpone the approval of. The, both the claims register and the payroll until next meeting. I'll make this, I'll second that. Uh, all in, I have a first and second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Mm -hmm. Passes unanimously. Is uh, for now reports, uh, is there a director's report? Uh, there is, uh, Madam Vice President. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Nick Renizen, who most of you know. Um, I don't have any hand report this evening. We've got some other things on the agenda on that. So I'd like to introduce uh, Mr. Renizen, our former Deputy Mayor and Parks Director, uh, to talk to you about the City of Bloomington uh, Capital Improvements, Inc. He's going to give you a quick rundown there. Um, I'm going to share my screen. There are a couple of PowerPoint slides that uh, we want to share with you. So, um. Well, while he's pulling that up, I just wanted to uh, Thank you for entertaining the opportunity to present to you today. I think we probably will see more of you in the future as our role is a bit more defined. Sarah's on our board. Cindy Canardi has been helping us with interviews for the RFI responses. Um, my understanding of the creation of this entity, which is created by the city administration and the city council, was to be an interfacing entity with the Redevelopment Commission, the community, and the administration to further projects that the administration and the community want to to pursue uh, capital projects for, hence the reason for the CBCI in our name. And you could think of us a little bit in the way that the Indianapolis Capital Improvements Board has been uh, working for decades now to initially repurpose the downtown and renovate it to what we all know it to be today and then to build capital facilities like uh, Lucas Oil Stadium and uh, the Market Square Arena renovations and many, many other things they've done. Now we're a much smaller scale and we're just beginning that journey, but we do hope to relieve some pressure on the city staff. Uh, we have plenty of things to do in their day jobs, uh, but still we'll be technical in experts and subject matter experts for our work with projects that uh, the administration and the community would like for us to pursue. 
The one we're mainly pursuing at the moment is Hopewell. I'm very excited about that. That was a, a project I was intensely involved with in my term as deputy mayor, and so we're beginning to see some uh, progress on the site, and I know the city has had several of the parcels conveyed over with um, the first RFI for the uh, lots 8, 9, and 10 out, which are the, the first things we've been reviewing along with getting ready for the next phase of the RFI process, which will be coming out soon, I understand. We've also been interviewing owner's representatives to help us and the community move the uh, master plan forward on Hopewell, and hopefully it'll be an update from that from Director Zodi here shortly. I thought what I would show you is how we view our role, and, and mind you, this is this is a work in progress. We're new enough. We've been created back in March. We've had three meetings. We meet every other week at the moment. And I'll show you where we are today without um, the CBCI's existence, which is right here. So your role never changes in either one of these slides you're about to see. Uh, the Redevelopment Commission has a reporting line to the City Council with appointments from the City Council. Uh, you also have appointments from the Mayor's Office. And then there's the direct link on the left side with the mayor's administration working with the city staff to effectuate any of the projects that come through or need support from the Redevelopment Commission. I think you all know the Hopewell Steering Committee was created several years ago to help guide us forward in the development of that project. And during my tenure as deputy mayor, work closely with them. Uh, they will continue to exist. Their role has changed a bit in that they were a big part of the master planning process and now they continue to be a kind of a check a check in with the city administration and our new board to make sure we're staying true to the concepts of the master plan as best we can the market may drive some changes over time but at the moment we're going to try to stick to the master plan because it was an intensive public process to get the the, the amount of public input that we did so that's the current situation and now we'll flip over to the new one which just inserts the cbci a lot more lines in there. Uh, the, the responsibilities of the Redevelopment Commission do not change one iota. Uh, rather, we come to you, the CBCI board down at the bottom, if there are any funding requests or anything we're going to do with property you own. Well, you own Hopewell. So if we have any decision making, uh, we don't have decision making authority. We have recommendations we will bring to this body that affect property and or uh, funding that we may need to effectively work forward on the master plans. Uh, goals. On the left hand side you see the change from Hopewell Steering Committee and that the Steering Committee will both work with the Mayor's Administration and us and we'll be engaging with them I understand in the coming months as they get an update on what's going on uh, again to just help with working with the, the Mayor's Administration to keep them abreast of what's going on and continue to get feedback from uh, that large group of people who were instrumental in the master plans formate formulation. And then the other things you'll see up under the mayor's administration, how we were created. The mayor appoints four members, the city council one member of the five. So, you know, Sarah is one of our members. Uh, I'm currently the president, Valerie Pena from Indiana University is on our board, along with John West, a local realtor, and um, uh, Doris Sims, who is the city council's appointee. And Doris is the former director of hand. and. Um, Took, was here before John Zodi took over for, for Doris. Uh, so that's, that's the new way that we interface with all of you. Uh, and I just thought it would be good for you to hear about us before we come to you in future months with uh, potential requests for you to move land around or respond to any initiatives that come out of our RFI process. Sarah, jump in. You're on our board if you have anything to add to, to that or you think I missed anything. Thank you. Happy to answer questions from any of the board I members. I have some, but you guys go ahead first. Ladies first. No. You want to start? They don't have any. All right. The, looking at the structure and what we're talking about, Mick, what we're really looking at is land acquisition that's owned by the redevelopment that will be transferred to the CVCI and then transferred to the potential developers. Is that the structure? That, that's one possibility, but any of the scenarios that we would bring forth would uh, be for you all to decide if you wanted to transfer property, lease the property, sell the property. We would come to you with options based on what the development community that will interface with tells us they would like to do, and then you all have the final say, of course, it's your land. So the CBCI could actually do parcel by parcel, building by building, as far as proposal, and then come to the RDC 
in order to say, what do you want to do with the land that's owned? Because the whole parcel is RTC at the present moment. And then if we're doing anything with a funding standpoint, what I'm seeing up here indicates that anything under five million comes to the RDC from a TIF fund standpoint, but anything over five then would become city council because we wouldn't, the CBCI through the redevelopment, if it's over five million, goes directly to the city council. So that if doesn't in that change from the current way that any anything that would come through you that's right. five million or three years uh -huh. uh, in, in, in its length has to go to the city council for approval. So whether we existed or not, that rule is the same for me. And Larry, you jump in and tell me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding that that hasn't changed one iota. But anything under five million, if you had a project mm -hmm. that came that was absolutely the best project possible, it was one piece of parcel of land, not a whole platted out parcel, it could come through be transferred to CBCI, could either recommend we could transfer to CBCI and then approve up to a five million situation just between the two. That's correct. The city, city council, council would not approval. have to approve it if it were under five million or okay. less than a three year arrangement. Okay. Uh, and, and, but it specifically deals with land and TIF funds. And mm -hmm. then we'd have to know exactly what our TIF fund availability is right. in order to do that. And, and we will follow the same process you all follow now in terms of. Uh, the introductory phase where a project is brought to you for a meeting for discussion and then there's another at least two weeks before you have any action to take. So we'll follow the same procedures that you're used to from any city staff project, led, city led staff project. Right. Appreciate that. So a couple questions. One is uh, the pale green potential staff, that would be potential staff serving the CBCI board. That is correct. So at the, at the moment we're interviewing owner's representatives mm -hmm. and we think that's a key piece to help all of the people, all the players up there, mm -hmm. uh, reach the development community, that's their expertise. They would mm -hmm. directly report to us, but the funding agreement for such an arrangement probably would come through you. So we would bring something to you when and if we had a successful owner's representative mm -hmm. arrangement that we and We would like to pay them, but you would, uh, they would work for you guys. Kind of both. Well, I think the idea is that the RDC is Had like it administrate like is is it looking it's an oversight. advisory board all but but it's providing oversight right mm -hmm. so the RDC is an oversight entity mm -hmm. but on a day to day basis we're not getting into the weeds of mm -hmm. operational so issues. sort of like John Fernandez so, we're right, paying exactly that's, that's a good comparison. Comparison. it's a very good comparison mm -hmm. and so the idea with the CBCI board is that um, this frees up. Um, some some of the kind of mayor mayor's administrative staff from yes. having to deal with all of the issues around mm -hmm. redevelopment right. of the Hopewell site because it is such a big project mm -hmm. and so um, since RDC does not have an operational component mm -hmm. to it in terms of mm -hmm. that like right. the mayor can't offload that to RDC so right. this is okay. filling in that role. Um, Next question what is in terms of Hopewell Steering Committee, and I realize the big focus right now is the Hopewell project. However, uh, in, uh, if I can remember correctly, in creating the CBCI, uh, the mayor and the administration mentioned also, for example, the potential new convention ex expansion, and there's a couple of other things too. So is it likely that in this case for Hopewell, there's the Hopewell Steering Committee, which is directly focused on that, and in the next case there might be a convention expansion committee that focuses on it and another expansion whatever the next thing is that help you help the bigger board uh, with any particular big huge project yes that is correct uh, the arts are mentioned as a potential mm -hmm. another uh, element that this board this body cbc mm -hmm. i could get involved with right. the arts community the um, the mill mm -hmm. and the trades district, mm -hmm. uh, the convention center, all, all okay. those other three kind of have entities already working in <laughs> the realm of those three projects where Hopewell really didn't. Hopewell was the one lacking right. a real focused yeah. entity. So we, the board members, took that on first. I think that's our right. most important directive at the time. The others may or may not come okay. uh, before this group in the future. But yes, that's a good way to say okay. the, that not just the Hopewell group, but there will be other advisory groups yeah, should we get involved. We would reach out to, to many of the existing advisory groups if we get into those other projects. Thanks. And my third question, which is sort of an out in the public, but I want to ask it anyway. Um, since most other 
commissions like ours is three members mayor, two members city council. The historic preservation was four for the mayor and three for the city council. But four to one seems um, uh, m more heavily balanced to the mayor and who cares what the other one says, doesn't matter, they can, the majority already is with the mayor. So that seems awkward to me in the balance of the mayor's, any mayor's uh, administration and the city council that they represent, elected to represent the city. So um, I'd like to know about that. It seems mis misbalanced to me. I didn't create the appointments. No, I know uh, th that uh, certainly is uh, understandably a concern someone might have. I would point out that the Indianapolis Capital Improvements Board is heavily is a function of the mayor's office. Similar. So, that, so that's the very Much change. more close to this than, oh, okay. than the I three to two. Can I add one more thing in there? Mm -hmm. I think that the kind of um, how this was described to me also is that mm -hmm. most of what the CBCI board is doing is taking, ro taking roles that would have been internal to the mayor's administration. Oh. Mm -hmm. And and actually taking that on, and so, um, so having sense. a city council appointment on that is actually, in many ways, uh -huh. opening that up okay. to some mm -hmm. degree of city council involvement that wouldn't have been there before. Very so when you think about, if you think about the CBCI board and its structure in comparison to other boards and commissions, mm -hmm. it looks off. But if you think about it in right. terms of what is its function and what is the direction of movement, mm -hmm. it's actually the direction of movement towards more um, input from the council than would have okay. otherwise been in place. Didn't I, Mick, do you think that's that that's a fair? Yeah, as, as uh, we did research uh, about some of the existing arrangements, the city staff uh, did those things that they found that the models varied. So it's not it's not as typical no. as the boards and commissions that are part of our city's infrastructure that you're all well familiar with, like yours, and yeah. you mentioned yeah. the uh, historic Pretty preservation easy. group. Yeah. Many are more balanced between council right. and that. And that may be something that changes over time. Mm -hmm. This board may get bigger over time. If mm -hmm. we do more projects, sure. I think we probably have to yeah. consider some changes mm -hmm. to our makeup. But we're, we're like you, we're volunteers, community yeah. residents that want to help yeah. and think this is a good fit for mm -hmm. our skill sets and yeah. I hope that you see that too as we start to bring projects mm -hmm. forward to you. Well, thank you. I, those are, I appreciate all the answers and explanations. I just have one quick question. Just trying to identify where the role of the CBCI begins and ends in terms of it appears, let's say, for the example of Hopewell, at least is kind of clear for that transitional stage because obviously right now it's a matter of putting out the RFI or RFP for getting the development done and there'll be a stage at which the CBCI's role concludes because all of the land has been transferred to private development or to, own, to development ownership. Does that sound like an accurate assessment or are there other, like how do you know when your role is done in a given project? That's a really good question. Uh, this project probably has a time horizon of 10 or 15 years. Uh, maybe we'll see some development off of RFI 1 quickly and then it may take several years for the next phases to develop out uh, and then there may be just outliers depending on what happens in the world around us that we can't predict at this moment in time. So I, I would envision what you said, Deborah, to be fairly accurate. We'll be involved at the beginning, hopefully bringing the appropriate development deals to this body. You approve them, the developers do their thing, and then we're on to the next parcel if there is one left to do anything there or if not, the next project that the administration says we'd really like you to now focus on X in our community, whatever that might be. Um, I suspect there'll be some overlap in those things while we're doing Hopewell anyway, but at the moment, you know, we're pretty focused on Hopewell and Hopewell only. But yes, I think you, if that made sense, the way you summarized it is the way I would envision our beginning and ending for anything that would happen. Just we happen to have a pretty long first major project with a long horizon for development. Uh, what's the time frame you think to get an owner's representative on board? So just thinking, yeah, yeah three, six John, months. Is that in your or? report? Yeah, I'll, just, I'll let uh, just briefly. I'll let John address that. Any other questions? Questions from the public? Uh, do you want to continue your director's report? Sure. Uh, thank you. Mike. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, just uh, from what uh, Mr. Renizen said about the owner's rep. So we we are. We, we have interviewed a group of owners, uh, development representatives. Um, we've narrowed that group down, and so as we sort of have those final conversations, we wanted to let you know that that was moving, 
and then over the next couple of meetings you might see uh, a presentation when that's narrowed down there's uh, you know discussions about fees and what that would look like if, if we were to enter into an engagement with one of them and then there would obviously be a contract for the RDC to approve so that's sort of the update today and so at the May 15th meeting we'll keep you updated as that moves and you may see a, a presentation uh, coming then so, and Deb Koontz is going to be she has a bit of, about this in her Hopewell update coming up so she may say a little more as well so I'm sorry Randy I no, cut would, you off there would that be a situation where the owner's rep will be a contract with CBCI and then deals come to the redevelopment for funding accordingly or will it be a direct correlation based on dollars my understanding is the RDC would approve the contract so they would be contracted with the RDC I don't want to misspeak on how that and get, how that interacts with CBCI that's why I'm trying to qualify so, that where, yeah. where that where that stands from a responsibility CBCI will approve interview approve make recommendation then it'll be an owner's rep that will be funded through the RDC and the development or the contract itself will be directly the RDC I believe so okay. Mary, 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 excuse me is that I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. And if I may interject, I, I believe then that you wouldn't be necessarily the entity that oversees the owner's rep work uh, any more than you do when you uh, allocate money for anything else. You expect the work to be done for a contract. We would be your agent, so to speak, to make sure that that work that you approve the contract for is executed in the way that you see you you envision. And so we would continue to come to you to report and do those types of things, as we will the city council uh, in that arrangement up there and the reason for the for the question in regards to that was to make sure that they weren't coming to us and saying no, that you, you guys should be your course. agent to, right. to manage that right. part of it okay. for you you just approve the funding and the contract yeah, perfect thank you appreciate that yes. um, that concludes my report uh, I'll just note that uh, mr. Underwood and mr. Crowley are not here tonight so after mr. Allen's report we can probably uh, move into business Okay, I'll just ask for the next report and then take it, give it over to Cindy. Thanks. So a legal report, Larry? So a legal report, I'm happy to answer any questions. I will note that Jeff Underwood is in Hawaii, so the tougher time that you can give him <laughs> in this meeting, the more I'd appreciate it. <laughs> but I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Are you coming back? Unclear. <laughs> Very unclear. <laughs> we hope so, oh. but... So, Cindy, where we've done the director's report, legal report, and the other two are not here. Okay. So, starting with new business. If anybody has any questions, though, about the treasurer's report or the business report or generally that we can pass along to them, though, we're always happy to take them. <laughs> and <laughs> genuinely. Madam President, I think um, where we did that first resolution, I think Deb Koontz is going to do a Hopewell update prior to the first person. Screen. Yeah. Okay. So, I'm going to stop sharing here, and I believe she has the ability to share. So, All right. Uh, Now or later? Or do we need for resolution 2336? So we need to introduce that agenda item. Yeah, that'd be nice. Yeah. Okay. So, Deb, are you still presiding? Yeah. So we'll I, I am. Just let me know when you're here. Okay. So, uh, Deb, Deborah, we're just bringing you into. We're addressing resolution 2336, amended project review and approval form for Hopewell. If you'd care to give us a report, that would be wonderful. Thanks. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in addition to talking about the project review form, I thought it would be also a good opportunity to just give you an overall update. Um, we provided a presentation back in February, um, so I thought it would be good just to do an overall quick update. So today we're just going to remind you of the neighborhood vision. Uh, we did have some follow-up items since the February RDC meeting, so I want to give a quick report on that. And then we'll talk to you, uh, give you a quick update on the project conveyance, where we are, some of the owner's rep you've heard about tonight, uh, core building, and just kind of the general progress and challenges, and then we'll finish with the project review form update. Um, I think all of you know um, that there are really three main pillars for Hopewell and the vision for the 24-acre, 1,000-unit development, and that is around affordability, sustainability, and design excellence. And everything that we do is measured on how we can achieve those things. There are goals set out, um, as you can see for affordability. We want, uh, with 1,000 units, we want at least 20% of them to be affordable, plus additional for workforce housing. That is our goal across the entire neighborhood. Uh, for sustainability, looking at lead silver for all of the buildings who can achieve lead silver, particularly in the multifamily. 
and then design excellence to strive to overcome that trend towards cookie cutter design and continue to raise the bar for design and solution. So since our last meeting with you, last, our last update, we have got some accomplishments here I want to reference, and that is um, <clears throat> the RDC, we wanted you to uh, get involved in the RFI, the Development Owners Rep. Um, Cindy has been um, involved in that, and so we appreciate her involvement in it. We've already talked about CDPI and uh, it being organized. It was a reference at our February meeting. <clears throat> Tonight, there is a couple of uh, two different action items we're going to ask you to take some action on. One is the public land offering for the core building uh, redevelopment. The other is retaining an engineer for the Jackson Street and University Engineering. Uh, there is the Phase 1 East Infrastructure Rebuilding that's happening, and I think we told you about that as well. Those bids are due in a couple of days, so fingers and toes crossed that those come in where we want them to. And then the potential reuse of 714 South Rogers uh, one of the submissions that we have does have that potential in there. Now, not all of the items, uh, there are some items that are still tracking down here, and we'll talk about those in, in a few minutes. But, you know, these are the things we last left you with. <coughs> Excuse me. So we wanted to just give you a quick update on where those are. Additionally, in terms of the final property conveyance for my new house at Demolition, if you haven't been by, this is essentially what you see there. The demolition is complete. The final grading for the site is ongoing. And they do plan to seed this month. I wish we would have seeded um, during all this rain we've had recently because it was showing good grapes and grass, but they are in the process of getting that seeding done this May. And obviously getting the grass to stabilize is important for that turnover. Uh, the final conveyance by contract is December 31st. Of course, uh, personally, I'm hoping that it's sooner, and I think um, many on this call are as well. So, But that continues to go on as planned, and uh, we're excited about that development. Uh, just as a reminder, I put this slide on. I know that um, we talk a lot about the different blocks and where all the different kinds of housing is going to go in this development framework. But I thought this is um, this has been a great graphic that we've used and pulled from the master plan to show you know we have a lot of multifamily here, particularly um, along uh, on Second Street there, and a lot of the uh, single family and townhomes and multiplexes kind of here along first down to the south. And so just as a reminder, we are looking at the overall thousand units. This is a different way to see the same graphic, which is um, we think of these in blocks. So we reference them in blocks. Um, everything that is in gray blocks one, two, and three, and eight, nine, and 10. All of those blocks, again, it's one, two, and three, eight, nine, and 10, which are in the gray. Those are properties that the RDC owns already, just as a reminder. Um, and four, five, six, and seven are the properties that will be part of the final IU Health conveyance. So those are coming. We also use this graphic just to remind everybody about how much infrastructure has been funded. So that dark blue that you see here, there's been a lot that's funded already. We're gonna talk about that in the project review form, but obviously a lot yet to be funded, and that is in the dashed red line. Over the last couple of months, you've heard us talk about the Ready Grant for Jackson Street, and that is the portion of Jackson Street that goes, and that includes the design and construction of Jackson Street that goes from first up to what is was originally envisioned to be Greenway and is now going to be University. But fortunately, we're going to get to do a little bit of design um, in that up to 30% of the time. So again, a couple of different ways there to look at what those things are. So that leads me then into the development of the owner's rep update. Um, you've heard about the owner's development rep, but what we didn't say is that the RFI 1 that was issued for blocks 8, 9, and 10, and so just as a graphic reminder here, here's blocks 8, 9, and 10 here, and that is, we have received several submissions um, from local developers, so we've got a team of people who are involved, Cindy is represented for the RDC, and uh, so in the coming months, um, you're going to hear from us, um, hopefully within a, the next 30 to 90 days that you'll hear um, a little bit more about those. We are, they are definitely in review right now. The owner's development rep has already been referenced here, but um, we did interview five firms. Two firms were shortlisted and a recommendation is forthcoming. Uh, and, and as John said, um, our best estimate right now, assuming discussions with fees go well, uh, is that at your May 15th meeting, we would look at having um, the recommended firm come and do a presentation. And then following it, maybe at your next meeting, uh, propose to pro proposing a contract. So we are sort of giving you an update now. We want to make sure that you have a full presentation at your next meeting, and probably as the earliest the contract would come would be June the fifth. Um, so I know that question was was asked earlier, and I wanted to fill in that information. 
Additionally then, on blocks four, five, six, and seven, and again, just as a reminder, those are the blocks that um, will be coming to you in final property conveyance from IU Health. We are in the process of doing subdivision planning for that main hospital block. That's obviously a prep for future development, but also for the four buildings that we'll talk about in a couple of minutes. Um, and so that is heading its way through its normal cycle through the city and ultimately will go to the council for that approval. So those are some things that are happening on the development side. Additionally, the core building, um, if you haven't seen the rendering that was approved by the Historic Preservation Commission, um, that is what is included here. You'll actually see the core building, which is a limestone building here, um, which comes off of first. And then this is the addition that is proposed in new construction that will allow 38 affordable units through a wide tech deal uh, to be constructed. As I mentioned, the Historic Preservation Commission has approved it. So if they have some variances that they needed to seek, the developer needed to seek, those were also approved. Um, we look, uh, hope that you will be doing the, uh, approving the public offering today, um, proposed for May 1st here. And we're all, with that approval, we are working toward a, a July 2023 tax credit submission, and that is in partnership with Brinshore. So while I didn't write that on here, uh, Brinshore did, was the, uh, uh, submitted to an RFI a year or so ago for this project, and they're a developer out of Chicago. They are using a local architect. Um, that is Bridge Point Architects, who you're probably familiar with. So we're happy to see that um, it was approved on its first vote through the historic preservation. And I'm confident that's because we had uh, the good Bridge Point on board with us. Now, just a few other progress updates, and then we'll get to the project review form. Um, the community outreach, uh, we do have a steering committee meeting that's not annual, so that will be coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Um, I know there's outreach that John and MC do with the neighborhood organizations. If you haven't been by, there has been some parcel signage that's been in put in place. I do think one of them may have been tagged with a little gra graffiti, but mm -hmm. fortunately, we paid a little extra to get that um, anti-graffiti uh, <laughs> film, and so they, um, they're in the process, but it hasn't come off for regular process. And then we're also contemplating some what updates, excuse me, website updates may need to be considered as we continue to go forward. And of course, a lot happens on the infrastructure side. The first street reconstruction will be out to bid soon. Uh, the second street modernization is in design. And with Jackson Street, uh, so the partial work on Jackson Street, which I referenced earlier, funded by that $1.8 million ready grant, um, with your approval tonight, we'll move forward into the design phase. The phase one east demolition is complete. Of course, I've mentioned already the phase one east infrastructure is bidding. And then obviously, work the, we want to continue to leverage additional federal funds and in a few minutes. I'm going to talk about, uh, share with you how the uh, uh, engineering department is able to leverage even more. Now, we can't talk about progress and good things without just framing up that we continue to have some challenges, of course. Uh, construction costs do seem to be hot, continue to be high. Um, they are, uh, there are some areas where we're starting to see some stabilization, but I would say they are not going down and don't appear to be going down anytime soon. Um, John could probably talk in more detail about this, but he gets the security reports, but we've had continued security challenges at the site, with, particularly with the buildings that are still standing at, at, at blocks eight, nine, and 10. Um, I mentioned the infrastructure bid, a bit over budget, we're actively rebidding. Um, we do need to seek council approval of the subdivision of that, um, of the where the main hospital was. So alley right away, that's never a, 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 a guarantee, but um, we know that because of what we've seen them do with phase one east, that we should be in pretty good shape as we follow that similar path on the subdivision for the next. And then the additional support in the development and structural electricity side. That structural maybe is maybe a little bit misleading, but it's really in the development and that's really the reference to the development owner's rep. So I did mention earlier that um, I was gonna uh, highlight some, another good thing that has happened in the project and that um, NDOT through its federal program has identified additional funding that they want to push toward the first street reconstruction project. Um, those increased construction costs are because of the market conditions that the feds and the NDOT have been seeing. And so they want to push more money to this project to make sure that it can actually happen in their city <coughs> market conditions. Um, and so the additional federal dollar contribution is actually going up by over a million dollars. Um, it is going to increase the city's match by $274,000. However, 
Um, we think that with this additional federal money, the chances of this coming in at a budget and a bid that is actually possible for that first rate recon reconstruction actually makes it more plausible. So the total construction um, cost budget for this is going to be just just a little bit over five million dollars. So that is going to come into play because while it's great to get more money from the from the feds, um, it, it also um, there's a little bit on our side we need to pay. But overall, we think this is going to make sure that even within today's market, that there is an opportunity for this project to continue forward because we know our developers are really um, interested in counting on what is happening at the first street construction project as well. Let me then move into the final section which tees us up for the project review form discussion. Over the past 30 days or so, we've been doing a reconciliation with Jeff Underwood in the controller's office. Um, there have been a, t the RDC has approved to date $12.5 million worth of total contract. And in your project review form, um, as you know in typical fashion, there are recommendations, there are some recommendations to make a few minor adjustments, but to also um, make some uh, projections going forward. We did have a chance to talk to Cindy about this last week. And um, frankly, I think today we want to, uh, I'll say, fix a few things from uh, Resolution 2210 that we need to make some adjustments on. But we also want to make sure that as we look forward, we are giving you a bigger, broader picture of what we, where we think the expenses are going to be for the next couple of years and are going to be asking you to take an make an increase of the TIF of $5 million from $25 million up to $30 million. And so uh, while I know all the details are on your project review form, we thought it would be good to just look at a quick synopsis on the sources and uses between uh, 2210, which is what has been approved to date, to 2326, I hope I have that right, um, the, uh, that is actually being proposed for tonight. And so you see here that there are many sources, right? We have TIF sources, we have the federal roadway sources, which is what I just talked about, the difference of 2.9 million, that's just a little bit over 4 million, and then we have the ready grant, which is at 1.8 million. Previously, um, those sources added up to 27.905.934, we are proposing today that they actually are very likely going to be at 35, 8, 69, 190 million. Um, you'll see that the uses that were projected, um, not approved, but the ones that were projected even slightly were over the 27 million. And we're projecting uses of right now 35 million, knowing that there is a little bit of wiggle room between the sources and the uses if other things do come up. So wanted to share you that comparison. Again, it's in your project review form. And you might say, well, what is this all about? Why are we, what is the proposed amendment all about? And again, we're trying to give you a bigger view of what the next couple of years look like um, with uh, some exceptions. And that is the proposed amendment includes increased security, some owner, the owner development rep services that we talked about earlier, uh, lead for neighborhoods, and which relates to the sustainability commitment, parking garage assessment, the project management services, um, some of the Jackson Street, or the Jackson Street design and some of the Hopewell West design, the first street, 1% uh, earth allowed work for the infrastructure to date, the website update and hosting an additional site promotage, uh, promotional signage. What this does not include is this does not include the in, any future infrastructure that may or may not be covered by developers. This also does not include the garage, any garage renovations that may come out of the parking garage assessment. So I want to be clear, those things are not included. Now, I do know that there's been some, and, and I will add that to this project review from slide before that gets sent out. Um, some, of, some of you may be thinking, well, how do we get this money back? What, you know, what is it, how do we get some of this money returned to us? And um, Larry can speak to this in great detail, but there are ways through redevelopment fees that we have the ability to retain pull back some of these costs. But there are rules around this, right? So so these are these are some of the rules. Uh, and also keep in mind that the redevelopment fees come when development happens. So we aren't going to have that redevelopment for the first one, probably the earliest that one would come in line is going to be 2024 when it's going to come. So but let's think about this. What where could that redevelopment fees actually come from? They they are any costs that are incurred by the city to retain preserve the land structures or undertake the redevelopment, such as land purchase or that value of the land, 
cost of the offering, the demolition, the permitting, the fees, the environmental, or any ongoing costs associated with, and we've listed a few here, that park maintenance, the stormwater management, the security, the overall maintenance of mowing and things like that. So these are the areas as we bring development um, opportunities back to the RDC where some of these redevelopment fees can be recouped over time, right? So it's gonna take time for that to happen. Um, we, you, you saw a map earlier where I showed blue roads that were funded and red roads that were not funded. Um, we are asking developers to partner with us and to help us do that infrastructure. Um, not all of them are seeing the value of helping us do that infrastructure, I will tell you. Um, but that is part of what's going to be happening as, in, as we continue to move forward with RFIs. And I think that's also really an important reason why that owner development rep is so critical is, you know, what is realistic to ask developers to take on and or um, what is realistic that we might have to do or if there's more grants. I mean, the ready grant was amazing. I believe if we check the budget, the, uh, the state just approved a bunch more ready grants. So let's, uh, I think there's opportunities to also seek more uh, grant funding to help with the infrastructure. So what's coming next? Um, if the project review form amendment is approved within the next, um, approved tonight, I should say, approved tonight, within the next 30, 40, 30 to 90 days, the development owner's <coughs> rep contract proposal with a pre-meeting, right, on the 15th, is look, or we're looking at, assuming that the construction contracts for phase one use infrastructure come in well, that'll be coming. Um, some sort of review or um, potentially recommendation for R51 on blocks 8, 9, and 10. We'll see how that goes. We, as we said earlier, there are some proposals that they provided. Security planning contract, uh, parking garage assessment, and website update. And then there's a few other things down here below that we are tracking, um, some of which you've heard about tonight. Um, and so we're going to be bringing those back as time for, uh, as the right time timing is. But we do know there's some key things that are coming forward. So with that, that's a lot. So I will, happy to answer any questions. Questions from commissioners? Go ahead, ladies first. Yeah, you go first. No, you go first. Okay. okay. Deb, uh, as we're looking at that, when we're looking at the 8, 9, and 10 that were out at the present moment for review, do we have a time frame? Because when we start talking about the safety and security, you know, as those buildings continue to set and, you know, be be a particular potential possibility for unwanted inhabitants at the time, as our safety and security yeah. of our community holds in, at what point do we look at that and say, we've got a time frame to deal with a developer that is actually looking at it in order to secure those or to actually start looking at how we would demolish some of those structures in order to take care of it. Because from a cost standpoint, you know, the earlier is the better versus waiting until something might potentially occur. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a great question. I think you have to look at, you know, why we don't want to throw good money after bad there. And so we, we have been looking at what would it take to demolish the building. Um, that is not included in tonight's project review form. We also have the ability, we think, with some of the RFI proposals on 8, 9, and 10, to essentially incorporate that development through their proposal. Um, the earliest, I believe, at this point that we're gonna be bringing anything back to the RDC is gonna be either probably July or August for the uh, uh, proposals eight, nine, and 10. Part of that relates to, um, we don't want to make decisions before we fully have some vetting time with the development owner's rep to make sure that we're going down the strong path. And so, uh, but I can tell you that we are considering both, and we are doing our due diligence to know what both options are. The reason I, or as I ask those questions in regards to those specific buildings, with the exception of the one that is this, what I refer to as the 714 building, the other structural buildings themselves, any of our proposals, and I'm making an assumption here, are not yeah. assuming yeah. to reutilize those buildings. That's correct. So, you have a correct assumption. So the cost. The only one, so the cost associated would be borne either by the developer or by us, therefore reducing the cost at the least that's amount. Right. And that's right. That's why we're holding off, frankly, because um, we do believe that these, some, some, a few of the developers actually have that demolition cost built into their proposal. 
And if that's the case, then that's one less thing that the city has to pay for directly. Right. Well, so I think it's worth some consideration. But at the same time, if we pay, how much do we pay in security costs to get there? Okay. And then, right? Yeah. Exactly. So just safety and security of the community is what my concern is as we yeah. go through this because, you know, as we should, nothing happens quickly so that we don't make any mistakes with it. But the ongoing nuisance could be, could have created us a problem. Next question regards to dealing with your overall view in regards to it with the thousand residents we're looking at. And as you brought up the map that indicated a significant amount of multifamily, are we looking at this multifamily aspect into an owner occupied situation as opposed to a rental situation as we look at these proposals? Yeah, good and question. Yeah, so we have asked the developers, you know, the next RFI is going to be uh, for blocks one, two, and three, which is back over here by the B line and along the Greenway. And we are actually asking the, the uh, developers to identify how some of that multifamily could be owner occupied, could be separated off. So we, we do expect that to be part of the proposal. Okay, uh, but we haven't identified from our larger vision what kind of owner occupied we're looking at in these particular areas. It's just what the developers propose at the time and then make a decision we're gonna yes we're gonna let them propose and let uh, the city weigh in as to whether they feel like that is going to meet their expectations or not thank you mm -hmm. I have a couple questions one is i realize it's a little early because you're just getting you know information from the developers but when you talk about the 20 percent of the um residential target that would be what i'll call below market um, any anticipation besides the LIHTC project, which we're not talking about, you know, that's only 37 units out of the, let's say, 200, that's the 20%. What kind of gap financing is going to help to underwrite the below market units? Is that expected to be kind of, you know, funded by the market rate units or what's the vision or is that up to the developer? Because I, I heard what you said about the developers not being crazy about also funding infrastructure. I'm just wondering how many things that they're expected to fund in terms of their proposals. Yeah. Well, I think it will be up to the developers. I mean, I, 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 I'll just speak to 8, 9, 10 without releasing lots of details here. But, you know, I think we saw some who are using the market rate for that. We saw others um, leverage other opportunities. I do think that um, there are going to be some asks of the city, right? Overall, um, is it is it going to be to an infrastructure is part of the thing? I, I think it's all part of one big formula. They're not freaking out and saying we need this for affordable, we need that for something else. Um, but and I don't know if John wants to weigh in on this at all uh, in his dealings with other properties. But it, you know, and and, and frankly, the core building, right? Because even with that, there are still gaps. Interest rates continue to be high. And I think we will continue to see the developers providing asks. Now, they're providing asks, but at the same time, uh, my impression of what we've been given so far is they're going to meet the goals of the affordability. So, I don't have anything to add. I think, yeah. I think the ask to the city and making all the numbers work is very much uh, a challenge and an opportunity. <laughs> I would say that we're just we're preparing yeah. for those. I mean, the the core building project is going to come to us with some asks as well. So make all that work we've got to do it one other quick question sorry just you have for most of the line items in the exhibit a there's an estimate even if it's not fully in there yet but as you noted the in this amendment for example the parking garage design and retro freight is not included and it just says to be determined so my question is what will it take to get an estimate to at least plug into this because it's not included in this amendment which is already an additional five million above the original commitment the the uh, uh, the assessment right now like probably at least 2.8 million to get a start up that's right now but we feel like maybe we can i don't know whether we can bring that down or not i'm definitely maybe being calling in about that but uh, but the assessment is the only thing that's really going to be able to go to that next level. Okay. That's why the assessment is the first step. So thank you, Deb, for a really informative presentation. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about how much of kind of the additions into the um, estimated costs are 
really kind of just fleshing out things that kind of we always knew were going to be um, expenditures on this pro project and we're just kind of getting more information about them so that we can develop a better sense of the overall costs and how much are kind of new. Um, I know that this resolution does not actually appropriate any more money, but um, it is, you know, indicating that the costs are rising um, a bit. So I, I'd like to kind of, um, and, and in particular, you know, like the consulting, the step one consulting has, in, that cost has increased over a million dollars in terms of estimation. So, um, you know, some of the estimates as well, you know, for like fencing and barricades, um, I have no idea how to kind of assess this $200,000, the right amount for um, fencing and barricades. That sounds to me like that might be kind of high, but I don't really know. So could you tell us a little bit more? It's a little bit hard for me to have a good, like to assess <laughs> what what's in front of us right now. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say some of it is um, just the project continues. We get, to, you know, the farther we get into it, the more we're finding out some of the needs. And I will say security, fencing, you know, those kinds of things. Uh, yeah, those are things that we, uh, I think we had hoped we maybe wouldn't have to do that much, which is why we had the original security patrols. We also know that um, it's going to continue for some time if, if the develop it takes time for the developers to get in there and do that. So I would say those are, you know, those are a few examples of that. I think we always suspected that the parking garage was going to come back with some kind of um, financial need. I, I think if the mayor was here, he would very quickly say, I did, we should use it as is. I think your parking um, department disagreed and, and always thought that we'd probably have to do something. I, well, IU Health take, took good care of it. It is an aged garage and um, it is not ready to be utilized up to the level that your other garages are. Um, on this consulting side, uh, just back up at this, I'm sorry I'm not going in order here, on the consulting side, I think it's a matter of uh, the first fees for the, this were identified for a couple of years, and now this is the longer years, right? So this is additional years uh, that continues it on. I think there was, uh, for the last, since 20, the early 22, I think there's been a hope that we wouldn't have to hire an owner's development rep to be a better advisor on the development side, but that that um, has passed. And again, that's looking at a maximum two-year contract. You don't have to go into a two-year contract with them, right? That's going to be part of the conversation is what do we do with them. But as we talked with Cindy, we thought it would be better to give you the bigger picture of where we think it could go over the next couple of years, as opposed to piecemeal this year and then give you another thing next year. So this really is trying to be more comprehensive look over the next couple of years. Again, there's some there's some exceptions and one of a couple of exceptions are we don't have any more infrastructure in these numbers. We don't have the garage construction which is cited there. Um, and we don't have any demolition of existing buildings. The assumption is is that you know, most of that infrastructure and demolition um, we can get hopefully through the developers. We may find later that we can't. So we we also have to keep looking for other ways to do that. Help? Yes, and do you have, like, when you look at this and you look at the kind of expectations and the estimated costs about the um, breakdown between different types of costs, like, did you have particular um, metrics that you wanted to meet? Like, you know, what is a, like, so this is indicative of, you know, like, basically, like, how, how much, what percentage of the project should go towards should be taken up by consulting fees versus how much should be by design um, versus construction like is that something that you're thinking about is the just so that we understand sort of how this budget um, across these different budgetary um, lines compares with kind of um, what the expectation should be so when we look at a more traditional project like the first street reconstruction phase one each you know those we know that clearly the metrics of you know, what should our fees be versus what construction is. Uh, this, comparing the con overall consulting fees to the overall um, investment by the city as a development, I'm not sure I could say exactly what those could be, but I'm happy to do a little research um, on it as well to make sure that we're falling within those metrics. But 
I think it all relates to time and that, that is one of the things, particularly on the consulting side, it is the longer it takes, the more, uh, that's why we're trying to get more our buys out, right? Get more development heard. We gotta keep keep things moving and are eager to get that last, those last pieces, the parcel um, back from IU Health as well. Does that help? Yes, thank you. So my question uh, is different. It's about and the environment and the green uh, possibilities, especially when you look at the map there. Uh, do the if uh, you're hoping the developers will help build the infrastructure, they may or they may not, and we may have to build the infrastructure, the superstructure, which we for me is the green stuff on top. And as with the Kmart development, uh, when approved, there was a lot more green, and then as things are built, there's a lot less green. Um, and so um, on both of them. And so there's, yes. are the developers of each parcel expected to provide as much green as possible in our, our hope for master plan of green stuff instead of just construction materials? Or we do that? Or how is, how is the maximization of green that's possible going to happen in this pr structure of proposals, RFIs, and everything else? Okay, good question. So let me start with a traditional block. Um, and so your UDO, right, the Uniform Development Ordinance, outlines what those requirements are. So for a traditional block, let's say like where 714 South Rogers is there at Rogers and First, that would be considered kind of a traditional block. That is gonna be defined by the UDO and by taking on that development, the development partner, unless they get some sort of variance, is required to do what's in your UDO. So that is where that requirement comes from. And then the, I would say the other piece is the greenway, right? That center kind of greenway is really um, one of the most fantastic, I think, parts about Hopewell as well is creating kind of that, uh, not that live work play, but an area for people to come to that maybe don't even live there. And so phase one east, um, that is already in. So that greening of that section of phase one east is actually in. There, you may notice, and let me just share again, and just the visual goes a long way here. This is probably shows it the best. So this, these green boxes here, right? That's the green way that's already uh, funded through this uh, this project review form. But these orange boxes here are the ones that are not funded yet, right? So those are the ones that we need to try to find funding for as well, because we really need these mm -hmm. to help complete that green way as it goes across. So there's kind of two parts. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Deb, can you, um, on the demolition line item that's in red on the on the project review form, can you tell me what that includes specifically? It's a 7C demolition and remediation, 2022 to 2023. So that was the uh, demolition, that's phase one E specifically. So remember there was uh, several buildings, including um, some old IU Health kind of storage facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had to demolish those as part of an initial contract. So there was an initial demolition contract that was let by the RDC. That work is now complete. And then there was a little bit of remediation that happened with that as well. So that is a, a con the reason that it is not red and that it's black is that contract is complete and the RDC already funded that. So this budget doesn't have any proposed demolition in it? It has no proposed demolition in it. Okay. I mean, we, it, it, you know. So I do, I do think, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I do think it would be interesting to kind of compare and contrast a proposed demolition cost to a proposed security cost. Security, yeah. Um, just to see where that kind of weighs out so yeah. we can come to a, an intersection of when it makes sense to go ahead and pull the trigger on demolition because as I as you presented earlier it looks like demolition could be captured in a redevelopment fee along with you know security etc sure sure let's do it yeah I will definitely pull that in and we can have it at your next meeting and ready to go perfect any other Anybody questions go ahead I'm sorry no, I was just going to say, you know, the project review form, obviously, if you decide to take that money and not spend security AG demolition, right? Uh, those are adjustments that the RDC absolutely can make, so I'm happy to submit that. I think you're going to find that you probably are uh, money ahead if we do that. 
I think the question is, is how long do you wait for a developer to take it on, right? That, that's really becomes the question. Is do you go ahead and wait for a developer or do you just take it on and deal with it? I was just going to say that just I mean, this is more of a like comment or request um, to um, to Larry and John is that it, I think it would be very helpful for us kind of moving forward. I, I realize that this resolution does not actually um, is is not actually um, you know. Um, making it like we're not we're not voting on actually spending money right now but I think it would be useful to have a bit more of a presentation by Jeff um, for us to understand sort of what this sort of budgetary kind of expectation does in terms of um, the RDC's um, budget as well as what that means in terms of opportunity costs I think at, you know as we keep talking about hope well it's a really um, it's a type of opportunity that doesn't come up very often right and so it's important to get it right but I do think it would also it's a little bit hard to sort of keep track of all of the money when we're not thinking about it in terms of what does it mean to the overall budget and what does it mean in terms of like what like is it constraining us in, in other respects so I w that would be great if we could have that. It's a, it's a shame that he's not here today to talk more about it, but yeah. Just a, as a clarification though, I mean, yeah, and absolutely we could have Jeff here to do that. So as a clarification, the way that we approve the actual funding, there is an internal process for that review. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the one step for the controller's <laughs> office to see what is planned out and to do that long-term budgeting, mm -hmm. particularly with TIF revenues. But for every contract that comes through after we receive a bid, it does go through a review process where it's submitted to the controller's office and they do match that up against what are the available funds, what's going to be the long-term available funds. And as Deb has sat through many meetings with Jeff to hammer out what that budget is. So he, he could absolutely give you that presentation, but just so you know, like that is a process that happens every single contract that we do and every yeah. single piece of I mean, I'm sure that is, but the issue is that like when we're being asked to mm -hmm. vote on it and like, you know, it would just be nice mm -hmm. to kind of Mm -hmm. be doing What's it on context? more than more than like faith that everything is you know, cool. Yeah, I'm just going to quick add on to what Sarah's saying, which is just this is a consolidated TIF, but there's nonetheless kind of the individual areas that were originally part of why particular geographic areas were selected to be part of a TIF. And one question I have that is part of that bigger picture is how are the other geographic areas being served by TIF money if so much is being invested in Hopewell project, which again, once in a lifetime opportunity, it's excellent to have the opportunity to put TIF money into there, but I appreciate the opportunity for some context that would help understand how other geographic areas that are in the consolidated TIF continue to get the benefit of being in the TIF if so much of the funds are being directed towards Hopewell. Yeah. There's an $800 million increase from what originally. <laughs> understandable but just the context of that and the additional items of 2.8 million for the garage you know cost of demolition and such if we could get something that would encompass some of these other items even if it's you know proposed as opposed to what it is that way we have a context to what the total is now I will switch if at all possible and can ask something that goes right back to sustainability and our lead aspect are we good on budget can I ask that question okay Dealing with the core building specifically, as we got through our historical uh, committee that we looked through, and we look at those, the visual on that. Are they using limestone? Since we're looking for lead silver mm -hmm. and that, I noticed the context in regards to how they had the drawing of it, and I'm just curious if they were going to limestone or if they're just using accent in regards to it because of the sustainability and the uh, lead aspect because of locally sourced materials. Yeah, do you want me to? Feel, feel free. We're the architect. Yeah, um, I do. Know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was just to say, I do know the answer, so I think. Good. Well, go ahead then, please. please. Yeah, they, they are including some limestone. Right. Not all of it is limestone, but they are including some. I'm sure they are finding a balance between using local materials and also using materials that economically fit their budget. Well, the reason I ask is we look at some of these construction projects that come about here in Monroe County, and developers are from outside the county. They bring in cast stone because they say it's more economically feasible. Yet, you know, we've got 
-hmm. We've got environmental constraints and climate change that we really need to look at in regards to, you know, the manufacture of the cement, the importing, the rest of it, as opposed to going five miles from the city of Bloomington and providing a locally sourced product that has made our university world renowned based on its architecture. So as we have this once in a lifetime opportunity, how do we encourage that particular type of architecture? So as you put it, we stay away from cookie cutter and get to the quality and clarity of what our community is as a whole by utilizing those, whether it be in a tax incentive aspect or how we help incentivize those things because that makes for long-term character. I mean, these buildings that we build at this present moment should long outlast all of us and 100 years from now, another redevelopment commission looking at like the core building where it has that structural integrity and the quality of the exterior to be able to be continued and be identified in this area. Yeah, I mean, so how as do I we was asking about context in the, in the, con in the context of budget, but in like <laughs> good architecture, it takes into consideration local context and that means using local materials. Yeah, I will double check with the architect, but it's my understanding that there are key, every time that we have entries, we're in the courtyard. You can't really see it because the courtyard yeah. is back there, but all of those are real life, so that they're not cast stone. Right. Well, I assume that's stuff. Building, but the, they are definitely tying it in. Right. They're, they're tying in the intent. And mm -hmm. so. Yeah, to be it, it, historically it, distinct, you have to. Right. Yeah, yeah, it has to be historically distinct. Yeah, right. it's not, they're not, if they match it, the historic preservation yeah, they, would not have approved it. Right. Yeah. I, I'm just. Not just the, I'm not picking up because Spring Point is phenomenal. Oh, no, architects okay. have no issues. They're phenomenal, yeah. And I understand yeah, the right. context they have to. I'm just making these comments based upon the project overall as we redevelop a complete community into a thousand dwelling units plus a core walkable, you know, vibrant area that we take that into consideration. So balancing I don't know how against to help economic that. viability, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and how do we help encourage that economic viability? Right. Because you know, the cheapest thing to build is a wood-framed perfect square, but it not it doesn't necessarily give you that sense of community by doing that. Yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act. It's a balance. So just have the. All right. Any other questions on resolution 23-36? One typo, just on line 11 in the budget or the you know exhibit A under neighborhood assignage. There's an extra digit under the estimate of the 20,000. I assume that's what that is. Oh, yeah. Good eyeballs. So just a correction that can be amended with um, the resolution. All right. Um, with that, I'll enter. Well, actually, are, is there any public comment? hearing any um, I'll entertain a motion for resolution 23-36 with the uh, typo correction Dip Hutton, I motion to I make a move, motion to approve resolution 23-36 with the amendment I have, a and a second. Mm -hmm. I have a first and a second all in favor signify by saying aye aye, aye. aye. anyone opposed <laughs> one abstention <laughs> All right, um, next item of business is resolution 23-37, preliminary design contract for Hopewell West. Who'd like to speak regarding this? Mr. Durkis from Engineering. All right. Sorry, you Hi, Patrick Durkis, uh, Engineering Department. Uh, no problem with the time. I. <laughs> These are all part of my project, so I'm interested in hearing uh, the additional background on them. Um, for Patrick, excuse me, uh, this contract is for uh, a 30% design of all of what we are calling Hopewell West, which is contained by uh, First Street to the south, Second Street to the north, uh, Rogers on the east, and then the uh, the uh, outer access road on the west side of the hospital site. Um, what this 30% design will do will set uh, profile grades um, and, uh, and street widths and also the greenway requirements uh, shown in the master plan 
and this will really be a, a template for us to build off of as we discuss with other developers. Um, for example, like with the core building, there's still the discussion of uh, how do we meet their elevation um, with Jackson Street, with the design, as they start planning so far ahead on, on their building design. Um, and, uh, and so similar to that, we want to have this 30% design to help developers as we move through the project. Um, also, part of that is to set Jackson Street, which is needed to service the core building, uh, we need to know how university is going to cut through the site and how Jackson will access university. Um, so we'll complete the 30% design, and then in addition, we will go to 100% uh, construction drawings for Jackson Street from first to the Greenway or now university. Um, so for that, we went out with an RFI to three, or went out with an RFI, we received three proposals. Um, Crossroads engineers uh, teamed with REA, who we're using for uh, phase one east, uh, scored the highest. Uh, we've started, well, we negotiated a contract with them. Uh, the Ready Grant uh, had a budget of 550000 for the design. Uh, the base design contract is 553000 and change. Uh, there is about $50,000 of uh, not to exceed um, hourly rates that will be uh, authorized by engineering as needed for the project. Those authorizations include uh, basically environmental services. We're utilizing the uh, um, ESD's um, EPA grant. Um, for uh, for both the phase one and the phase two environmental investigations so those will not be coming out of this project budget um, but that grant is only for a phase one and a phase two the uh, additional analysis and uh, necessary remediations uh, we need another consultant to provide that opinion and so we're using metric uh, who is the same consultant that we used on phase one east familiarity with the area and also um, to just, if needed, second opinions. Um, and then the other part is is uh, geotechnical. Um, we have geotech for First Street. We have it for Phase 1 East. We have a pretty good feeling for the area, um, but we would like to, uh, if necessary, utilize a geotech for, uh, typically we use them for, um, for soil analysis to see if we can use a, a thinner pavement section, which very quickly makes up for the cost uh, in the construction. Um, and then again, all of this will be reimbursed by the Ready Grant. Um, and the, the change in budget has already been discussed with uh, ROI, uh, who administers the Ready Grant for this. Uh, available for any questions. I have a question. What is a 30% um, plan? Is it 30, does that mean that there's another 70% that needs to be eventually planned out? Or like, what is it, what does it mean? <laughs> so uh, the, way we, the way we set up our plan designs is, uh, is based upon INDOT's steps. And so they, they go through steps called stage one, stage two, stage three, and then final tracings. Uh, and so stage one is basically a, a 30%, which means we lay out the entire site. We show where we think utilities will work. We show we, where we think the landscape architecture will work. We get a little bit into the grades and how those will work together. Um, but it has not been fully vetted. So basically, from to take a 30% design to a 60%, uh, you get into uh, more of the 3D modeling of it to see where pipes are going to conflict with each other, where walls are going to, to, to meet, how sidewalks will actually get down the grades and, and work in there. And so the 30% will prove out conceptually that all the elevations will work, uh, and it will get us how we will grade the site, it will get us how we will get utilities to each place, how we'll capture the storm water, um, but it doesn't go to the next step of vetting 
all of those through the next phase of the design. Um, so then is the idea that we do this first and then we may use the same contractors for the next stages or how does that kind of where do you go out again for another request for a proposal? So with all of our designs we own them. Um, we, we will get all of their work. <laughs> Uh, all of their CAD work, which is, and then all of their design assumptions. Um, it, most other consulting firms do not. There will be a, an additional expense not utilizing the same firm. Um, if, every design firm that takes over another design, um, I've been part of that on a on a bridge project, and we we looked at it and said we're just gonna start over um i i think going to 30 percent we're not going to if we decide to use a different firm we're not going to start over because really we're talking about the road profiles the full design has not been vetted so so whoever would take it over would would still be taking this and vetting it to the 60. If we took it to 60%, then I would say we will completely tie ourselves to the design firm. Um, if we went out for an RFI to complete this design, uh, I am sure it would be difficult for a design firm to compete with Crossroads experience on the project. Uh, but if, if we wanted to go back out on a competitive process, um, I don't think this would preclude us from that. So why go out and bid on just 30% as opposed to bid on 60% or the full project? I asked them to price 60%. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we couldn't have, I mean, it does not meet, meet within the ready grant budget. I got it. Okay. So this um, is to fulfill ready grant. Okay. It, the goal was this was to fulfill what was necessary to meet what we need to serve the core building with the ready grant. Um, if we would like to, you know, if if we'd like to fund it further, I mean, I would I would definitely recommend to a certain uh, a certain extent further, um, but for the ready grant, this is what we need to serve the core building development, and uh, and then I also think it it's not a it's definitely not a waste. It will it will set elevations for uh, future development if that's going to be you know infrastructure done by a developer. We'll already say this is. The elevation of your road this is where it goes this is you know how it fits into the site and so i think it's it's going to be a big benefit to us as we figure out how we want to progress the rest of the site thank you as you talk when we're getting to 30 percent in regards to it as we're going out eight nine and ten and where you're going up with your profiles in regards to your grade elevations. As these developers, whoever looks through this, this will give them the baseline that they then have to mark themselves to. So this is essentially the baseline that you're looking to do, to have, not just specifically for the core building, but for the site as a whole. 100% for the site as a whole. Uh, this will be Fairview from first to second. Okay. This will be University from Rogers to Fairview. Uh, and then we are looking at uh, if Jackson Street can actually go to Second Street. Um, we think keeping that grade would be great. Um, we have IU Health's uh, garage plans, and we're getting into the structural <laughs> details of them and making sure that we can expose that significant. If, if you all have been at the site and are familiar with it, the, the parking lot that was at the southwest corner of of rogers and second yeah, rogers and second uh there was a wall on the back side of that by the parking garage it's almost a 20-foot wall and so we're looking at can we lower all of that grade and remove that much fill from adjacent to the parking garage and connect us to second street because i think that would really open up the the site for for access through it and then also for how you can lay out uh, developments in it. Okay. Then when we get into this aspect of the 30% based on our ready grant, so it ends up being paid for within that, and we've got the $500,000 contingency fee in regards to, or not contingency, but additional items. 
that gets us to the 606. Oh, 50,000. 50,000, thank yes. you. Okay, 50,000, not 500. Yes, okay. did I misspeak? I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> may have been my interpretation. <laughs> okay, then we're good. 50,000, okay. I'm good with. 500,000, <laughs> I was a little concerned. <laughs> And, and on the on the fifty thousand, uh, we had already advised them to remove it from the construction inspection budget for this project, and uh, talking with with my department, uh, if the funding doesn't extend to affording construction inspection, we would look at performing that in house. Uh, it was originally budgeted to to hire full time professional uh, construction inspection. We have the skills in house. Uh, it's just uh, time commitments. And so if the budget does not work out, uh, our plan is to, to self-perform that and find the, find the, uh, the time to be able to do that. Okay. Appreciate that. All right, any other questions from commissioners on resolution 23-37? Any public comment? I'll entertain a motion for resolution 23-37. Uh, the same comment. That Deborah made found it would be in number 11 again with four digits four zeros instead of three in line 11. Hmm. I'll make a motion to approve with the amendment as noted okay. or the corrections no excuse me. Deb Hutton second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. Resolution passes. Next item of, on the agenda is resolution as soon as I get there. Resolution 23-38, Notice of Offering for Hopewell West Parcels. Who'd like to speak regarding this? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so as part of this ongoing Hopewell development, the conversation continues, and part of this, this part of the conversation is about that main site, which includes the core building, uh, the REC obtained two independent appraisals of those properties, and now we're ready to publish a notice of offering, uh, which is a required legal step where we publish this in the paper and then open any bids that we receive uh, at technically a public meeting. It would be held at uh, noon on uh, May 17th. Um, the offering prices are as shown um, on the, the notice of offering. So in this case, for the entire property, we've excluded the garage. Our intent is to keep that garage, but um, the offering price for the rest of the property would be $10.6 million. Or if there are independent bids, it would be 1.6 for the core administration building and surrounding immediately surrounding property, and 9 million for all other developable land. Of course, we would accept bids for any portion of that as well. Um, and there's there's requirements just in the statute about what this notice has so we have those in there including uh, we will be there's a map available to anybody that wants to bid on this they can come to City Hall and view it or we can email it to them uh, we have included that it is zoned for mixed use but there is the transform redevelopment overlay which council uh, passed as well and then anybody who wants to, a physical copy of the packet can of course come to the legal department and obtain that but otherwise, they should submit their offers uh, no later than noon on May 17th. I'm happy to answer any questions if you all have them about this specific. Questions from commissioners? Legal. This is a legal requirement that we need to do in order to even put out anything from an offering standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and if we don't receive any offers or we receive offers that come in below the asking price, uh, we have to wait 30 days uh, before we can engage in an approval process for, for those types of offers. So it's obviously common that we get offers that are for zero dollars or one dollar. Uh, and so those will have to just wait uh, after 30 days after we have opened those bids on May 17th. So that would be into June. Also, just to point out, just real quickly, is there's a $1,000 uh, from the general fund for the publication. The publication I don't know the exact cost, which is up to why it's up to a thousand dollars. It will not be a thousand dollars, or probably be more in the range of three hundred to four hundred dollars. But it's priced by word uh, in the Herald Times, so I just wanted to leave a little bit of wiggle room so we didn't have try to publish this and find that we don't have the budget to actually do so. All right. Any other questions from commissioners on Resolution twenty three thirty eight? Any public comment? 
All right, if not, I'll entertain a motion for resolution 23-38. Sarah Bowerly Anson, I motion to approve resolution 23-38. Randy Cassidy, I'll second. I have a first and a second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, resolution passes. Next item on the agenda is resolution 23-39, I hope. Yes, I'll take this one. All right. Um, I also uh, believe that uh, Cody Toothman is still on from the hand department to um <clears throat> pardon me to uh give you some more information so we have a rehab to bring before you tonight um let me say a word about our rehab projects to everyone you all have been um approving those that have come up where we need additional funds uh there was a big one that we all went through uh that had two or three uh, iterations before the rdc and so this one um there are two tonight this one is to uh, request um basically just an increase in funds to to finish off the project um and i'm going to tell you a little bit more about the rehabs just to sort of tee this up the next one will be um, a different scope we've we've noticed some mistakes that were made in some of our rehab projects which i'll go into uh, here shortly but for this one um i do want to tell you we're requesting an additional three thousand five hundred twenty eight dollars and 64 cents that would um, include um, the installation of some uh, stainless steel for the chimney. This is some chimney work that's being done um, and would also coat it from the inside. Um, and there is also some fun some funds in here to replace a shattered door in the basement of the house. Uh, and so Barry Collins, who's not able to be here tonight, has been working on this one uh, with the owners as well. This would be through the CDBG program, so it's a grant. Cody, do you have anything you'd want to add? Uh, in addition to that? No, no. I'm sorry. Okay. So I'll leave it there and be happy to answer questions. Questions from commissioners? We're in a grant situation. This will keep these people in this in their home. Yeah, that's so the sort of the emergency home repair. I know we've talked about sort of what constitutes an emergency. It's right. I understand that Cody, I don't know if you heard that question, but from an emergency standpoint, we've got a chimney that's uh, unstable that's been uh, added on to the work here for the most part, and then yeah. of course the door is necessary. Mm -hmm. So, yep. I'm just confused about the the cost because in some place some places it seems like in the third or in the fourth whereas clause it says additional funds in amount not to exceed four thousand one hundred thirty four dollars and fifty four cents and then it has like a five thousand something like minus the original contingency and then in the um, paragraph two of the resolution it's saying three thousand five hundred twenty eight dollars and sixty four cents instead of four thousand one hundred thirty four dollars and fifty four cents so um i'm happy i'm just a little confused so is it four thousand one hundred thirty four or three thousand five hundred twenty eight um i'm happy to approve either of those i just want to sure. understand what it is that I could give any, any comment there. I can, I can try if you're. Uh, on this one, the final total was uh, what we were originally quoted to finish out the project by the contractor was actually overbid a little bit because he had actually already done some of the work that was on that final change order. Uh, so Barry, when he drafted the resolution, subtracted out. Uh, the pertinent totals from that to get the final amount of the 3528 i believe so is the is the commission being asked to re approve them the 3528 that we need to correct the resolution uh the 3528 is the uh, final amount that would be needed to complete the project so we we'd have that be the amount to not not to exceed right so to follow yeah. on that breakdown of costs I can't I don't know what page doesn't have a page number is ends up mm -hmm. at four thousand one hundred thirty four fifty four that would include the contingency, contingency. Oh, 10 percent contingency, contingency. Oh, okay so I, I I think the amount uh Commissioner Hutton that you're talking about is the four thousand one hundred thirty four which matches the resolution so that includes okay. the contingency there so yeah it's just it's confusing because mm -hmm. there's a the right this this first 
addendum, like the first page right after the resolution, suggests that the total cost is $5,246.54, and then there's a contingency amount that is subtracted out, mm -hmm. and then that leads to $4,134.54. But then further down, there's this you know other um, change order that it is so it sounds like the issue is that the first the first breakdown of costs was the original thing that was submitted but there was a problem with it and so what we are looking at is the change order change order 012022 and that's the one that has the correct um, dollar amount but that dollar amount doesn't match the dollar amount that is in the resolution so again happy to happy to um a vote affirmatively but i just just knowing mm -hmm. what it's supposed to be <laughs> yeah. the understanding based upon the resolution is a not to exceed amount that if we're going to do approve anything that would go three thousand five hundred twenty eight dollars and sixty four cents overall and there's a 400 uh, yeah there's a contingency aspect of 40 476 dollars and 96 and the change order says that it's three thousand two hundred seven dollars and 58 cents so maybe there's some sort of additional overage mm -hmm. to um Don, can we table this until next meeting or do we need that um yeah i think we could probably just approve yeah. the if the, the board needed to continue i figured it out think yeah it's just it's the amount plus a 10 percent contingency on top of it yeah so, it's the, so that's where you're going to, need to be rewarded and yeah yeah the numbers need to match yeah so we do need to keep moving on the work so how does the commission want to i mean i think we can approve a, a not to exceed number okay and that's not to exceed number larry unless you tell me differently there's two ways we, we could do this. We could do this on a reimbursement basis. So if the if the department uh, used its funds to continue this work, then at the next meeting, if we wanted to revise this, uh, the the commission could then just approve that amount. Now this is this is specifically using the guidelines that you all passed and, and requiring you to approve any amount over the the minimum. So that's that's the trickier part here. Um, if we, I don't know what the timeline is for the work or what you're doing with that. I mean, if we wanted, we could actually even just table this to the end of the meeting if Cody would like to work on and get us the right numbers uh, so that we know what we could specifically amend here. Uh, that, that's also possible just to move on to the next agenda item and then we could come back to this at the very, very end after the public hearing. Okay, let's, let's try that. Yeah, and, and we're looking for a final number that includes yeah. contingency. Exactly. The resolution has two different not to exceeds, one on the whereas and one on the therefore. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's con that's my source of confusion. So I I don't we don't need a resolution to move on, do we? You, you could just move on to the next agenda. Okay. And we'll know that you're going to come back to this. All right. Yeah, Moving good. on, resolution 23-40. Who'd like to speak? I'll do this. I'm just thinking. Hey, Cody, can you work on a final number while we're doing this other, the other agenda items? Yes. Okay. Yes, I can. Thanks. We'll come back to you. Okay. So um, on 2140, or excuse me, 2340, we um, are coming to you tonight. Don't need your approval necessarily of the funds, the expenditure, as much as we do to memorialize the, the situation here. Okay. So we. Uh, when we brought on uh, Barry Collins, we, we hadn't been doing a lot of rehabs. Barry got a lot going in the pipeline, and so a lot were moving very quickly. And so, as you know, part of these, it's required our, our, environment, our environmental uh, tests, environmental review, any lead testing if the house is of a certain age, and some of that was missed. And so on some of these, and there were probably seven uh, projects that we went back when we started going into these we realized one there was one that we said uh, okay this was missed how many others were there and so we went back and sort of audited them and um, we are caught up um, for a couple of them um, we realized it in the middle of the project that it hadn't been done prior so the uh, regulation states that before you begin any work 
you have to do this stuff if there are any issues you you do remediation and all that stuff on on two of them specifically the work we were right in the middle of the project number one was a CDBG grant project where we where we were replacing um, water had frozen this was a situation where the freeze happened over Christmas uh, a person had not been able to use their indoor plumbing um, and the pipes froze and then burst and then once when that got fixed uh, they realized that the sewer pipe was bad and so they they dug into the ground they put a shovel in the ground uncovered the sewer pipe realized that was it was asbestos and so we contacted HUD and said what do we do and they said you have you should have done the environmental testing ahead of time we said we get that uh, you can either wait you can appeal this to HUD for which could take four to six months or you can just use local funds so we chose local funds to get this done so that one is a grant that is done um, we used local funds for that this one is through the home program which is an owner occupied rehab which is a loan and the reason we're bringing it to you tonight is because um, just to, for transparency to make you aware that this happened but also um, the gr the agreements um, are loan based and so once the property is no longer um, an asset of the homeowner whether or not they are there or the house is sold that money would need to come back to the city prior to it being dispersed elsewhere and we want to maintain the integrity of that loan so that we do get the money back um, because the grant agreements or the loan agreements were say Home, home program, HUD, and reference federal guidelines, legal thought this was the best uh, best solution to sort of memorialize this transaction and keep everything as it is, rather than going back and doing all the agreements again, doing a resolution that just acknowledges that we use local funds for this. With this house, this is a um, historic home, um, and there was a lead issue here. And so uh, work had started on the exterior and in the basement, and so we are, you will look at the breakdown of costs, which, um, can see we need to do these a little differently next time. Um, there have been a couple of steps of lead remediation. There's no one in the house uh, that is uh, that the homeowner is uh, working with us, and um, she is not of the age that would put her in danger of lead poisoning, and, and everything is okay from that front. Uh, that was one of the first things we, we uh, uh, tackled. But um, work is continuing here, and we want to keep it going because this all has also happened in the middle, so we have used local funds for this as well. The local funds we used are program funds out of the hand department. You'll see a reference to uh, the 256 account. And that is, those are local funds that are program dollars that the department had been allocated um, a number of years ago. And last year, as part of the budget process, we sort of re reorganized and cleaned some things up. And that left a, um, a fund, uh, that left program funds there that we could use um, say this carefully at the department's discretion and so we talked to the controller's office and the mayor's office and said here's what we think we should do um, the other five or so we one uh, we hadn't really we, we'd either substantially completed the work or we hadn't begun it enough to say we can't we couldn't stop things and so I put uh, stop work orders on a couple of projects so stop everything until we get this stuff done um, others were cleared by HUD. I mean, in the, when you do the environmental review process, there's a step process. You either, it becomes exempt because there's nothing that goes on and everything's clear, the house doesn't, there's no lead, it's, the house is newer, whatever, and it, it clears pretty well in the system. There are some that flag. Uh, so if there's a lead issue or with the house that you all approved on Hopewell Street, it's proximal to a, a railroad. Um, and so where we felt there was an issue that we didn't need to go and do anything we went ahead and sent that to hud and everything else is cleared so hud signed off on on others uh and we have the request for release of funds and we should be in good shape uh this one however uh was a bigger deal and so there you are um so we're asked tonight is to approve the resolution to sort of memorialize that uh situation so we're caught in the middle mm -hmm. we have to need to approve it homeowner is aware of the circumstances since this is a loan situation yes yeah so he so. if there's any changes of the covenants of the loan and such they're in agreement to that without any arbitrary yeah. concern and Barry has worked Barry and Cody both have worked with the homeowner through this process the contractor um, also is recertifying their lead certification uh, which we are helping pay for which we've done in the past so we have lead certified contractors that can do the work okay. on on homes that are um, uh, may have had lead paint 
in there. So, um, so we feel good about where we are. We've corrected the process. I will tell you, you may ask logical question, how did stuff like this get missed? Um, I think the transfer of the rehab project management from staff to staff resulted in some changes on how they were done. We have reinstituted a checklist um, that is about 10 pages. Uh, so nothing happens without, I have to sign it at three different places and everything goes in a way that uh, will allow, you know, we know it, nothing is 100%. I could come back to you and say we made another mistake, but we feel pretty good about the correction we made here to take, take the action that needed to uh, make sure stuff like this didn't happen again. And so, and everyone on staff now knows, um, because uh, Gloria, our Historic Preservation Program Manager, does the bulk of the environmental reviews. That's part of her job description. And so um, we have a different process we use to vet these projects now. So we feel good about the corrective action we took, but did make a mistake here, so. This is just memorializing the aspect we're looking at. The other projects that are in the pipeline, mm -hmm that you've put stop work on it. And since these are emergency repairs, will they be able to continue on? This one was not an emergency. No, um, I'm not talking this particular one. Yeah, one so yeah, if we, we are sort of caught up now. So all the yeah. all the problems we had um, sort of going into the holidays and at first in the first quarter, we're sort of caught up. All the stop work orders are lifted and nothing is sort of uh, on hold anymore. Um, so it's moving it's, forward. And then the la the only other qu question I have in regards to it is when we get into our 256 account, mm -hmm. is there still adequate funds in that to be able to continue to take care of our citizens that are having issues? Yeah. So that fund is uh, really unobligated. So okay. um, it was not otherwise dedicated toward anything. It was um, an obligated program dollars that we were using. We uh, had used it for. Um, some equipment that we purchased and um, so we are using it for these projects so and you'll see down at the bottom um, we should have about forty thousand dollars left in there once this project is completed so some of the additional expenses that came with this project are lead uh, lead remediation so there was lead uh, lead was cleaned up once um, and then uh, there, the basement, the foundation has some issues, and so there is lead that gets in. When it rains, there's lead that kind of comes in off the walls in the basement, and so uh, the environmental firm has recommended that we do a lead clearance when all the all the work is done. Come back and do a lead clearance, and the homeowner is okay with that. So, and with that, will is in redevelopment in hand. Mm -hmm. You'll still have adequate hand adequate dollars to help people as is necessary. Right. This was not this was not um, money that was appropriated for a specific program and so we have all of our other programs are intact uh, here. So we just uh, obviously not ideal that we used local funds for this. We don't like to do that. Um, when you violate regulation, which is what happened here technically, we uh, did not follow regulations so we otherwise violated it. They will um, do a finding and tell you you need to do this differently next time uh, or they'll make you pay the money back. We sort of said on these two, we're, we're not even going to try. I didn't think it was, I mean, HUD told us on the first one, on the second one, we just said this is too messy for uh, to elevate it for an environmental review. We need to get the work done. We've got lead there. We're just going to get it done. and Clean it up and move forward. That's right. And understand the process for the future. Right. Any other questions on resolution 23-40? Any public comment? I'll entertain a motion for resolution 23-40. Make a motion to approve resolution 23-40. Mm -hmm. And second. First and a second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right. We are moving into our public hearing phase of our meeting tonight. We'll uh, share some slides with the group here. Um, okay. So we are doing a home, just a uh, hearing for our uh, home ARP plan. We submitted that on March 24th, as the commission knows, and received our first uh, review. Um, the uh, department uh, HUD wants us to wanted us to include different language in our public notice, and so because we didn't do that, um, they would like us to have another public hearing, which is what we're doing tonight. I will also tell you there were some date uh, the dates still said 2022 instead of 2023, which technically is, um, you know, also a correction they wanted, but uh, by and large, they wanted to make sure that the notice included accommodation language for those that might need, um, might be uh, 
have limited proficiency in English and things like that. So uh, just to recap briefly, the, the city is going to receive a little over $2 million in uh, rescue funds from the uh, Home Investment Partnership Program from the American Rescue Plan that must be used to serve four qualifying populations, uh, those who are homeless, at risk of homelessness, fleeing or attempting to flee domestic dating violence, sexual assault, stalking, human trafficking, and other populations requiring services or housing assistance that might otherwise put them at risk of housing instability or homelessness. Um, the recommended use of funds, uh, based on the uh, about 40 hours we did of consultation in putting this allocation plan together, uh, with, was a focus on uh, supportive services, so assessments, case management, housing navigation, uh, ongoing case management, street outreach, which, which would include uh, ongoing, just sustained street outreach to complement efforts of uh, uh, our DR, our, uh, downtown resource officers and community family resources as well as medical services, groups like HealthNet who are uh, doing some of that on, on the street, triage medical care. Also rental projects with supportive housing. Um, and we, of course we want to complement this with the efforts of the Heading Home of South Central Indiana initiative uh, who are close partners on this. So we have the same draft budget. This is what was presented to you prior to the plan submission. Um, I have a tilde next to development of affordable rental housing. Um, we are getting some feedback on that, that depending on the status of the project, we may not be able to put these dollars into them. If one has already broken ground and that's probably gonna be an issue, um, I'm gonna leave it there tonight um, because we're um, uh, still working through that, uh, but we are looking at how uh, those funds are applied. Uh, the home program, you cannot uh, commit money before ground is broken. Uh, ARPA was not that way, and so we have realized that there is a, which path did they take here, and they've taken the home path uh, there. And so um, we are getting a few uh, data points back asking us for more information on data to increase or to, to, to uh, make evidence that we do in fact have a, a gap for case management and supportive services and so we're working with providers to uh, return that information back to HUD here in uh, in uh, toward the end of May. So again we have till 2030 to spend these funds when they're when they're the plan is approved. So uh, plan is undergoing revisions I'll get those back to HUD on May 19th uh, that's the sort of deadline the 30 45 day deadline they, they ask We've got data coming back, um, public hearing tonight, and I'll ask any public comments get back to me by May 15th, and I'll incorporate them into the plan if needed uh, prior to submitting it back to HUD. So happy to answer any questions from there. Any questions from commissioners? Um, for the supportive services grants, if mm -hmm. you don't mind just going back one sure. slide, please. Uh, on the budget? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, how would those be allocated? Is that something that's on a competitive basis or? So what, what has to happen, it's a good question. Um, what we're envisioning now is, uh, it, it is not in the plan how, it, that, that, that's not provided in detail. We would do it, um, my current thinking is we would do it similar to how we do CDBG maybe. Um, one of the challenges we're gonna have is that this is uh, roughly $800,000 that has to go over a number of years and we want to make sure that it's narrowed and focused to the supportive services that were included and approved and that they're just limited to those that serve these four qualifying populations that's a requirement so my current thought and the thought of others I've talked to is that we would do sort of a competitive grant program um, that's where we are right now would it be competitive one time and then committed for let's say the time period until it had to be spent down by or would it be I mean because it have or, or could it be, you know, like come back again next year for the next um, allocation? I don't know. I think we, my, my thought is once this plan gets approved and we sign a grant agreement, which will allow us to use the funds, we have to get a group back together. And I think we need to really have a serious conversation about how those funds are dispersed. If it makes sense to do one round for you have two or three years to spend this money or we do an annual round. I really worry about spreading it kind of too thin and I want it to be focused. So, but I don't think I'm, I need some more input on how that works and that's what we'll have to do later this year. It's gonna okay. take two, seven years and it's 700,000 plus change. It's only $100,000 a year. It's really, it's not Doesn't go very far, yeah. And, and this, the uh, seven years, you know, we'll have to, spend it down prior to that because there's accounting and everything else has to happen but that is the drop dead deadline to have it spent 
Yeah, to that point, what kind of, it'd be interesting to know what kind of uh, success metrics would be in place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spending the money, did it have the, the outcomes that, that, you know, we're looking for? Is that an annual reporting requirement? Yeah. And if, if the, those metrics aren't being met, would funding stop at that point? So it's not seven years and we get nothing to show for it. Yeah. That's a good. That's a good point. And some of the data points we're being asked to provide back are what are the gaps, and then the natural question is where the gaps filled, right? So that's that's where they're trying to go with the uh, feedback they've given thus far. So. All right. Any other questions on resolution? Well, no resolution. It's the home investment partnership. So what we really need to ask is any public comment. Yeah, uh, I'll be right yeah. I had one more comment, if I could. Please. Just. We have a copy of the notice of public hearing in the packet, and it's pretty general. But I mean, what you have here is actually a bit more specific. And I'm just, you know, it's just trying to understand in terms of because you mentioned there was, you know, something public notice that wasn't fully fulfilled last time in terms of accommodations, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is it is there a format to be able to provide a little more information about what the public hearing will cover, or is that available on a link? The city provides because again this just talks about you know activities and who it can benefit but mm -hmm. doesn't really give an idea of what the city's proposing okay. or where it's at so I was just wondering is that something that's available if somebody saw there was a public hearing and wanted to make public comment where they'd have more information about what would actually be discussed at the public hearing sure I think post tense if we're talking about tonight we would ask them uh, we could make this this meeting available. We also have the draft plan. We could send them. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but well, um, something that wouldn't require like additional, you know, just sure. like somebody sees the the public notice mm -hmm. and they're like, oh, I wonder what's going on yeah. with that. Is there anything that the city could have provided or could in the future that we're getting now that doesn't appear in this public notice? It just seems like it would be more yeah. inviting to for public comment sure. to provide some more information than what is in this kind yeah. of standard public notice. So the uh, the plan was online uh, uh, during the 30-day public comment period. Okay. Um, so when we did the previous public notices and then when I went to the council, I did went, went before the council three times, I think, and said, this is happening, here's when our public meetings are, here's how we're, I basically gave this PowerPoint presentation for the city council uh, ahead of the public meetings and then put it online during the public hearing. So at this point, now that we're sort of, we're doing this, this sort of a makeup hearing, hearing, right? Um, at this point, I would still refer them to the draft plan, and we could put it back online uh, if we wanted to. Okay. That's just the, in terms of consistency, yeah, it's clearly it's already been shared, and sure. just kind of for anybody who didn't get it the first time around, just to have the general plus the specific in the same place would be, yeah. I think, helpful. Okay. All right. Any comment. any other questions? If not, I'll ask for public comment. Don't we'll see any members of the public wanting to yeah. comment, but. All right, real, real, go ahead. Real, real quick question in regards to it. Based on our notice of public hearing, time frame we're dealing with versus or as it comes into redevelopment into hand, when will these programs actually be able to be start being utilized accordingly and sure. take care of some of the problems based upon the allocations of the dollars and these ARPA funds, which, and I please clarify me, they're running through redevelopment because they're hand distributed. Is that the here, correct statement? They're running through here, you mean? That's why. The redevelopment uh, commission? Well, because you, you went to the city council and such. I'm just asking the question of yeah, so what the... We anticipate that the, so the reason they're running through here is because the RDC is the oversight body for hand. Right. Once the revisions are approved, uh, there could be a couple more back and forth between us and HUD. I expect the grant agreement to happen late summer, fall. And then uh, maybe around the first of the year, we would have grant uh, a grant program that we could we could get funding out. So start looking to see how we yeah yeah allocate based one yeah. three years seven years. Okay. And I'm trying to be conservative there because I, I don't want to set expectations that we're going to disperse funds later this year, just knowing timelines. And um, we also have our annual action plan that's moving through the process as well. So HUD is very busy in, in addition. So. so to utilize any of these dollars, we're looking at probably spring before people could actually start. Yeah, that, that's it conservatively, yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, um, not hearing any public comment, this will end the public hearing portion of our meeting tonight.
and I'd like to go back to resolution 23-39 to see if there's been any um, finalization on those numbers. Cody, you still with us? Yes. Okay, what do you got? Uh, so the 4,000 number was actually the correct one. Uh, it looks like the glass door change order number two that's listed uh, wasn't added on to the total in the resolution. Mm -hmm. so, so that with contingency should be the difference. So what is the total number for? Is it the 4,134.54? Yes. And that should be in both places in the fourth whereas and on the, at the end of number two. Is that right? Correct. Cody, can I ask you a question? Yes, sir. Um, when the original contract for this property, was there a resolution that approved the uh, $2,238 above the $10,000 EHR amount? I believe so. I'm trying to remember when this was done, if it was before or after it was approved to actually raise the limits initially. But I believe that one was done. I don't have the file right here in front of me, though. And my computer died, otherwise I would just search it. But. The reason why I ask is for the commission's sake, this is uh, at minimum, it's about $7,500 over the $10,000 limit. It might be best to be on the safe side since there are a lot of contingencies here, just in the basis. I don't think it makes sense to take out the contingency from the approval number. If we're going to build in a 10% contingency, it seems like you all have to approve that 10% contingency for anything else that goes wrong. So my recommendation here, Cody and everybody else, would be to just go ahead and approve. I would approve $7,500 just to be on the safe side, so a total amount not to exceed uh, $17,500 for this project. Uh, that way, there's no question that both change orders are covered with uh, contingencies on top of that, if that makes sense. Cody, how do you feel about that? Uh, that I feel fine with. I believe the contingency was removed because it had not yet been uh, encompassed fully within the uh, change orders and that's why Barry decided to remove that total or, or subtract it from the remaining amount there. So just but I, I, I think that makes sense uh, overall. So just to clarify, Larry, uh, if we look at the fourth fourth whereas, we don't talk, we won't, you're rec are you recommending that we don't mention the 4,000, the 5,000, the 10 percent contingency, $400, Minus original, we go straight to we request um, we we approve or staff city city staff is is requesting additional funds up to seventeen thousand and whatever for the entire project period. That's correct. With no little no amounts. That's at all. the easiest way of doing that so, with with the yeah, exhibits right. attached. Yeah, well, seventeen thousand five hundred. No, no, for the for the for the entire for the entire for the project. Entire project. Yeah. project. Yeah. So, so that would include the ten thousand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If we wanted to change the whereas, if you wanted me to edit that, my recommendation of that edit would be city staff is requesting additional funds from the CDBG funds totaling an amount not to exceed 7500 for a grand total of 17500 for this project. Is there a way to add in here um, additionally, like if there what, if we did vote on something previously and whereas like we already... We could, except I don't have that information in front of me. If my computer wasn't dead, I would love to grab that for Yeah, you. I don't know if I can find that on, like, because I don't know what, what, the, what I, the number would be. Because just because, you know, otherwise we're going to have this other random thing that we have voted on that's that's not connected to this that's floating out there. So that's actually why I'm suggesting doing it okay. this way. Okay. Because the other one will be superseded by this resolution. Okay. Got and it. so that way the grand total for all expenditures will not exceed 17,500. You're a good lawyer. Well, let's, <laughs> let's be careful. Um, my other suggestion would say is to have uh, Cody and Barry, if they're willing, to come back to the next meeting and report out on the specific amounts uh, expended so we know what we save on that and whether those contingencies are necessary. Given your first recommendation regarding whereas number four, what would your recommendation for item number two be? The RDC hereby approves, and how those words would change to match the fourth whereas. 
or I would say the, the, I would take out the additional funds. I would say the RDC hereby approves from the community development block grant to pay for the project instead of the additional chimney repairs. The project mm -hmm. at um, 213 North Sheffield. The project, mm -hmm. at, that's great. At mm -hmm. 213 North Sheffield, a total amount not to exceed $17,500. Thank you. All right, any other questions? Is there a, a motion? I motion to approve. Deb Potton will second. As amended. As amended. As amended. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, is there any other general business discussion for tonight? If not, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. So second. All right, good night. Thank you. Thank you.